any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. I heard a question you asked, um, Francis, but not the whole conversation. Maybe if you think it's possible here to talk about it or it was about the love and the desire that he responded. Like even the desire is also the love, but pointed to an object and then the true love. If briefly, whatever you got from his answer, I really appreciate it. Thank you. I don't recall the, the conversation, but I can uh, speak about uh, love and desire. Thank you. So, and I think this also uh, resonate with uh, Francis' teaching as far as my understanding of his teaching. That the desire is love, as you said, directed to as an object. Love is formless and the object is form. And yet, when you take a closer look at form, you will find that there are two aspects to form. There is the conceptual aspect and the experiential aspect. Conceptually, a form is very specifically defined and form A, a table, differs from form B, a tree. So conceptually, Forms differ because the concepts differ. But experientially, your experience of a table and your experience of the tree are the same, which is the experience of consciousness. Before you move from the experiential to the conceptual, the division, the separation between the table and the tree has not yet occurred. You know the table in the same way that you know the tree via consciousness. And your knowingness of the table as well as your knowingness of the tree is the same experience of awareness. And awareness which is the perceiving aspect 
in your experience is not phenomenal, it's luminal. And so is love. Before you attribute or associate love with an object, like I love my car, I love my partner, I love my children. Before attributing a phenomenal quality to love, Love is noon. It is the recognition of wholeness, of oneness, the non-dual understanding. She is a non-dual reality. Reality is one. So objects, experientially, are nothing else but love. They're nothing else but consciousness. Before they are conceptually distinguished as different objects, different forms. The experience of objects is the experience of consciousness. So desiring an object, desiring an experience, is desiring the reality of the option. The reality of the experience. And there is one reality, which is love itself. So one could say that desiring an object is love desiring itself via an object, through an object, towards an object. But in fact, there is no object. And in desiring an object or a situation, in fact, you're desiring the end of that object, the end of the desire. Let's say you desire that your son or your daughter acts in a certain way. Your desire is fulfilled when your son or daughter acts in the way or behaves in the way that you were desiring. And at that moment, upon which your son or daughter is acting in the way you wished, your desire for them to act in that way ends because it's fulfilled. Your desire is fulfilled. And the fulfillment of your desire is the desireless state. And the desireless state is love. So behind every desire is the desire for desirelessness. The desire for any object is in fact the desire for the end of the desire. The desire for desirelessness 
which is the desire for love. Because in love, there is no desire. There is peace and happiness, joy, and celebration. So there is only love for love in everything we do, in all our pursuits and all our activities, all our desires are the desire for desirelessness, the desire for love. And that desire is fulfilled the moment you recognize that there is one reality and that reality is a reality of consciousness and that you are that reality and as that one reality second to none you are fulfilled you are desirelessness itself upon that simple and yet profound, profound understanding You're welcome to play whatever game you want to play. Why not? Okay. Experience and celebrate various impersonal desires. A desire to travel, a desire to learn how to play the piano, a desire to learn a certain sport and a certain art form. Because then your desires are celebratory. They're not trying to fulfill a lack. Trying to fulfill a void. So much. That's beautifully stated. Thank you. Appreciate all you do. Thank you, my dear. Recognition of love in you and others. Thanks. I, I try to get to the exact question I'm asking, but when you were speaking earlier, you were talking about decisions. And the decision to li to live, um, or the decision to respond, I, I believe you said, is love. Is it, versus other choices and decisions we make, and I see sometimes you'll you'll post or talk about you know li you know what what if we live as if or what if we think as if there's no separation. Is this? Because when, when I read that and when I hear that, on the one hand, I know it's not, but I also think of it as a like being spoken, like the separate self being spoken to or an invitation to the separate self to make a choice or to act a certain way. Is that is that a helpful way to think about it at all? Or should, should I be thinking about that completely differently? Well, there is no separate self. So if you do perceive the invitation as being as an invitation to the separate self, the so-called separate self to act in a certain way. All right, that's that's fine. You invite 
set itself to act as if there is one reality, as if the separate self that you are and the separate self that I am are the same separate self. Okay, yes, doesn't really matter, you know. But more precisely, I am never addressing anybody else but my very self. It's always this one self. It is the self within itself, to itself, from itself. In other words, the consciousness that perceives through the body-mind named Richard and the consciousness which perceives if you have the body-mind named Megdi is the same consciousness. So it is that consciousness that is speaking via this body-mind and that is hearing via another body mind that's that same consciousness. Uh, now, the invitation to recognize that there is one consciousness is different from the invitation to live as if we are the same consciousness. As if means to assume that the other is yourself, to sort of be open to the possibility that the other is the same, the same self as you. That, that would be to live as if, or do your best in living as if, the other is the very self, that there is one reality, your reality, and the so-called other reality is, is the same reality. That is different from investigating the belief that the reality which proceeds through the body-mind negative is different from the reality that perceives via the body-mind nature. It's a different uh, approach. The inquiry into whether there are two realities would be asking yourself what would be the evidence that there is one reality. If there is any evidence that there are two realities, that evidence means that there is an awareness of those two realities and we can experience a reality that is blue and a reality that is red. There are two distinct realities. This is very case experiential. This is, here's the evidence. Here is the snapshot of reality A and it's blue. And here's the snapshot of reality B and it's red. Blue is blue, red is red. They are different. They are two distinct realities. Then the question is, what is it that is perceiving that there are two realities? There is something which is perceiving both the blue and the, the red reality. That which is perceiving those two distinct realities can only be one reality, which by the very fact that it is perceiving both of them, that there is therefore connected to both of, both of them, therefore it is that reality which is the one reality. Now, there's also, of course, the investigation of what evidence do I have that the consciousness that right now perceives this perception, the reality which right now perceives this perception, is limited, is always bound to a body, or is, is arising out of this specific brain and the, what evidence is there. Because if you have any evidence that the reality which perceives these words right now, which you refer to as I, right? I, the reality, I, consciousness, which hears these words right now. If you have any evidence 
that that reality is different from the reality which right now is perceiving this screen here. This, this. Do you have any evidence that there are two different realities, two different consciousnesses, and that consciousness is limited to the body mind? Then we have to conclude that there are two separate consciousnesses because the evidence imposes on us to, to, to be very pure in our conclusion. But in the absence of any evidence that the consciousness that perceives this perception right now is limited and bound or contained within a specific content, in the absence of this evidence, then we remain not knowing. We have to wait and investigate all other possibility until we find the evidence or until we come to a point where we can, in all honesty to ourselves, come to conclusion that, look, I have exhausted all the possible arguments that I have, that I know of. I've exhausted all these arguments. And I have not come to any one argument that substantiate the belief that consciousness is personal limited. At some point, you have to arrive to some conclusion after exhausting all the possible arguments and avenues that support this argument. And upon arriving to having exhausted all possible arguments and finding no evidence, then it would make sense for you to just say, okay, I am not knowing. I do not know, I have no evidence that consciousness is personal and limited, and therefore it's possible. I'm open to the possibility that it is otherwise, that consciousness is limitless, impersonal, non-dual. And that the moment you have exhausted all your arguments, you have relieved the mind from this constant sharing and it moves to a different stage where in a way you're surrendering to not knowing and in not knowing, there is freedom, and there is revelation, and there is understanding, there is magic of revelation. being open to the unknown. And we, we've spoken of that before, and, I, and, and yes, it is true. It's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of knowing to get to, to get to the acceptance of unknowing, which, which is, I guess, the process. But, uh, yes, but again, there is some, whatever, you, whatever, presents itself to you that is arguing, wait a minute, I am not you, I am separate from you. Whatever argument that you have that comes to you, whether it's a sensation, a feeling, a thought, or it's whatever it is, you need to investigate it. And this is in fact what we do here in, in our meetings, you know, when I take you. You need to investigate it. Because if you don't investigate a feeling, for example, I feel that I'm here and you are there. For example, you know, that, that feel, I feel that. Here's my evidence that I feel that I'm here 
and you're there. Okay. So you investigate that. You can investigate, for example, you say, okay, the feeling is something which appears to me. You're perceiving a feeling, right? Or a sensation. It's appearing to you. It's something you perceive. Then you can ask yourself the question. How can something which I perceive tell me something about the reality which perceives it? You follow? How can something which I perceive, a sensation, a feeling, whatever you call it, how can something which I perceive constitute an evidence about consciousness, which is the reality which perceives it? Does the oak tree know in which I perceive, know anything about the reality which perceives it? I mean, that's a good question. I don't. I. I. I don't know. I mean, not not based on any evidence. Right. Okay. I mean, yeah. yeah. No. The answer. The answer is no. Because if the oak tree knew anything about you, by now, having lived for so many years, by now you, you would have known. Okay. Yeah. The oak tree knows something about me. The oak tree knows that I'm. I'm a man standing. 20 feet from it, from it. I know that because the oak tree has revealed that to me. But you know what I mean? But at some point, you have to you have to make a decision whether does something which I perceive know anything about I, which is the reality which perceives it. You have to come to a yes or no based on some 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 if you say yes the oak tree knows something about me or the sensation knows something about me there has to be some evidence for that how can a sensation know something about you because a second later that sensation is gone or, or, 10 seconds later whatever and but you haven't gone. You, you're still there. Now a new sensation comes, to say something else about you, and then it's gone. But you're still there. Anyways, the point I wanted to make is that you need to investigate what evidence is there that consciousness is personal and separate and limited to body now. Whether it's a belief, a feeling, a sensation, a something you read in a book, you know, what I don't know. You have to contact with that investigation, and uh, and you need to arrive at some point to. Yes, I do have evidence that consciousness is personal limited, and here is the evidence. Uh, evidence one, two, three, four. Here, yeah, we can discuss them. Okay. Hopefully, you trust we can discuss them together. Or you say, "Well, I've tested. I check every every model I have that says that consciousness is personal and limited. That there are two realities. I've investigated, and I do not have any evidence. You can't remain wishy washy forever around this question." And I'm not saying that you need to prove to anybody, to yourself or to anybody, that consciousness is universal. No. Because in the absence of the belief that consciousness is personal and limited, consciousness is what it is. <laughs> it doesn't mean it is what it is. When we know consciousness because we are consciousness, we have an experience of consciousness, we experience we we know consciousness experiential because we are conscious. So we can speak firsthand about consciousness. 
that yes, I am consciousness. And this I, which is conscious, knows it is, I know I am. And I know that I am conscious. And this I perceives form. I perceive the oak tree. I perceive a thought. I perceive a memory. I perceive my neighbor's car. But I don't perceive I. I perceive a hand. I perceive the body, I perceive a hunger, sensation of hunger, but I don't perceive I. Consciousness doesn't perceive consciousness it, that, because consciousness is not an option. I can perceive my car in the garage. I can perceive my cat very well. But although I don't perceive I, I cannot deny I. I think with madness, if I could I deny it. Consciousness is its own proof. It stands in itself. It, it stands in its own ocean. It's its own proof every moment, every instant. Because it's constantly referring to itself. I. I am. I perceive. And everything that I perceive is coming and going. My children, they were 10 years old, then 20, then 30. My car, I used to own a Datsun in 1968, 69. Where is it now? I like the Datsun. It was a, cool, it was a nice little sportsy car. <laughs> yeah, my dad had a Datsun. But... Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was yellow. It's really yellow with a white top. It is really cool. Um, Everything that we perceive is constantly changing, appearing, disappearing. But have you ever experienced yourself appearing, disappearing? I mean, yes, it's hard to even, it's very hard to, to define what, when I say that there's identification with the separate self, it's very hard to even describe what that is, what the separate self is that I'm identifying with because there's nothing. There's no separate self. Right, right. It's interesting. It's, not, it's, it's interesting just that there's identification, although I recognize there is nothing to, to identify yeah, with. It's, it's a hoax. It's easier for to, for you to identify with a table because heck, the table the kids, the kids, the kitchen table. It is a table. <laughs> it, it makes more sense, you know, for me to believe I'm the table or than than is than in me. It's, it, it makes more sense because the table. Okay, fine. Here it is. You know, you carry it. You, uh, you know, sleep on it. You. Identification is simply the belief that consciousness is limited, that consciousness is belongs or is located behind my eyes or in the head or is look is inside the body, is a soul that's going to transmit away from one body. Identification is a belief about consciousness. And consciousness is the reality which perceives right now, which we refer to as karma. 
where we confuse I, consciousness, with the forms, some illusory, some forms say, well, there is a form in this, you look in the mirror and says, okay, this is the body, and we define, we associate consciousness with some specific or maybe not so specific form. Just a, a habit. Yeah, it's a habit, but it's a habit which the more we look into it, the less interesting it becomes. You know, some habits are good habits. You know, it's a good habit to put your keys in a place where you remember where they are when you want to do your car keys when you want to drive, you know where to go. And our habits are good habits. But the habit of limiting yourself or identifying yourself with a body mind that's, that's aging, that's aching, that's hungry, that's tired, that's annoyed because you've been in traffic for two hours. There are some habits that uh, are unhealthy and unhappy. And unnecessary. It's, it's not necessary. Thank, thank you. I'm, I'm just going to think about that. But thank, thank you. Okay, this is it. Yes, that's the topic. Yes, likewise. I wanted to ask you uh, if it's okay to try to change some of um, our as like the as some of the aspects of our human experience using for example visualizations um visualizations like visualization, or, visualization. Okay. or um yeah like creative imagination in order to try to change some aspects for example financial aspects or things related to health mm -hmm. you know it's it's that okay or it's, yeah. it's that just like ego stuff uh, i don't have much experience uh, with that emmanuel uh, um What I could share is that any belief you hold about yourself or about the world, about others, about God, any belief that you hold, um, that has no evidence for it. <clears throat> um, is useless and uh, could even be limiting. Um, Like sometimes we are surprised when we have to do something and we think, oh my God, I cannot do that. And then we have to do it. And it turns out to be, it was fine, you know. 
You go, my God, I, I thought I couldn't do this. And it wasn't that complicated. We all have experienced that, where we limit ourselves without even having tried when we are embarking on a new adventure there is a period of learning there is a what a period of learning okay mm -hmm. and that makes sense where we are unfamiliar with the uh, the activities with the terrain, with the procedures, take some time to get adapted, to become familiar, and to learn. And but over time, it becomes it becomes a routine, it becomes easy. You know. We have all been many times amazed by some things that have happened in all to us and to others because we weren't expecting such events to happen, meaning we thought that these events could not happen. been surprised at times by how things have unfolded in our life. It's a good idea to be open, to be surprised, to be open to the unknown, to meaning to infinite possibilities. Now, is a difference between being open to uni the universe with its bountifulness, very bountiful, simply because we recognize that the universe is infinite and that we are not separate from the universe. It's a different approach from coming with a begging ball. You have a begging ball and you're trying to learn a certain a certain way of begging that will fill your ball faster and faster. In other words, if you come from the sense of lack and you look at the universe to fulfill your sense of lack, you will be disappointed because you've already separated yourself from the bounty by adopting the sense of lack. So it may be better for you to investigate the sense of lack, the belief in lack. And you will find that the mind has a lot of evidence to keep the sense of lack alive, to maintain the sense of lack. Because once the mind has adopted the sense of lack, then all sorts of arguments will be generated to support it. So there are infinite possibilities in the universe and you are not separate from the universe.
you are open to the universe. You don't need any visualization for that. You just can look directly and notice that you're not separate. There's nothing separate. The air that you breathe, the sunshine that feeds you, the environment in which you live, your body and the universe are not separate. You don't need any visualization for that. It's direct. It's your direct experience. Not like, oh, I'm here and the universe is out there, the world is around me. No, you're not separate from the world. Your thoughts, they don't arise within your brain, within your body. Your thoughts are cosmic. It's the cosmos thinking. But the belief that, oh, I am thinking, distorts, it, it blocks the, uni the universe's conversation with you. Because the, you close yourself and you, you're in loop inside. You're doing a loop inside. Don't bother me. Don't talk to me. I am inside in my own story. That's an illusion. In fact, there is no container. Your thoughts are not inside your brain. Your thoughts appear to you out of the universe. Everything appears to you out of the universe. Because you and the universe are one. So be open to the universe. Be open to the bounty. Be open to the exploration. Be open to the surprise. You recognize the other as yourself, so you don't. You're not just serving yourself. You're not just spinning about me, 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 me. How about others? The universe needs you. Others need you. The world needs you because you're you. You're not separate from the world. You're not separate from others. I'm saying it needs you. Meaning it needs to for you to recognize that you're not separate from them. You're not separate from it. So you're not just serving yourself. You don't exist in a vacuum. You don't exist in a cocoon. You exist in relationships. We breathe the same air. I inhale what you inhale. You inhale what I exhale. We're, we're sharing the same reality. I don't know much about visualizations, you know. You, you, you need to ask somebody else about that. I don't have any experience with that. I only speaking about love and truth and happiness, not about. I don't know much about visualization in order to attain a goal in the army. Quite a few people who know more than me about manifesting and stuff like that. My experience with wealth is intimately connected with my experience with consciousness and love and truth. Somehow, they are not two, and they're not separate in my life. So I can only share that. But it's my experience that as you open up to the universe, you open up to love, you open up to truth, not to personal wealth. It's very different. It's not personal wealth, because there's no person. Personal wealth is a distortion in the field. It's connected with fear, personal desire. It's connected to the sense of lack and the belief in separation. This is where the root cause of the unhappiness is. 
Because you're not really looking for money, you're looking for happiness. You're looking for happiness. If you're a billionaire and miserable, or you're selling watermelon on the corner street and happy, which one you would want? You want to be happy. It's happiness you're looking for. Peace and happiness. Mm -hmm. And why not celebration of bounty in life? Why not? I'm, I'm open to it. But my happiness doesn't depend on it. For sure. My happiness doesn't depend on anything. On anything. And, and yet our yes at the core level it's true we we are one or there is just no, comfort the, 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 the one you know if you want to be comfortable that has to do with the body mind mm -hmm. you know comfort the comfort of the body yes of course it's a different thing yes of course we want to our business is to take care of the body the comfort of the body, the security of the body, the safety of the body, the health of the body. Mm -hmm. Sure, we do our best. For, for, for example, I've uh, suffered from insomnia for many, many, many years. And I'm pretty sure that it's related to anxiety. And basically, I know that the core of it, it's, uh, it's the ego. But knowing that, and let's say, keep exploring and deepening into the non-dual understanding, understanding, it hasn't, in, it hasn't um, created like a, an impact on this uh, situation of insomnia, and sometimes it's it's very uncomfortable. So I've been just like um, trying to find some alternatives to go directly into that. And, and well, I don't know. I find that maybe well, hypnosis and maybe some visualization and blah, blah, blah. In general, and, what, when you put the body to rest, you lie down in bed, you make sure the temperature is not too cold, not too hot. You, then the body is resting. But the mind is not resting. If the body is resting mm -hmm. and the mind is not resting, then we call that insomnia because the mind is not resting. Mm -hmm. So what is happening at the mind level? Is there a worry? Is there a concern? Is there a thought about something that's unhappy? For whom? For me. I am worried about tomorrow. I am regretting what I did yesterday. I am tired of living the same life. I am uh, tired of my boyfriend or my girlfriend. I want somebody else. I'm, the mind is, there is movement in the mind. Or sometimes there is an addiction to thinking. So I'm in bed, but I'm thinking about, okay, you know, uh, uh, how I'm going to fix my car. I mean, if, okay, maybe I change the carburetor. No, not the carburetor. I mean, check the brakes. No, oh, I check the brakes, but maybe I use those brakes, not those brakes. So then you're not inviting the mind to rest. You're interested in thinking about your car. That also is an activity of the mind. Mm -hmm. And after the car, you start thinking about painting your room. Oh, the, 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 my, this color, no, that the color. And after that, you're thinking about, you know, buying a new pair of shoes. I don't know. <laughs> so there are two sorts of activities uh, of the mind in, when you are going to rest. There is the activity in, in relation to any object. Just spinning, 
the habitual spinning of the mind around something. The news, let me go over the news. Oh, the political, the, we can spend lots of time spinning around the news. What happened? Why did he do this? Why did she do that? Uh, this government, uh, what's going to happen to the to this government? Or what's going to happen in Iraq or whatever? There is this sort of random, meaningless, useless thinking. And there is the me thought about, oh, me, what's going to happen to me? Why did I do this? Well? Now, then there are practical thoughts. Sometimes when we go to bed, there is a thought, oh, shoot, I, I need to send an email tomorrow to my boss about this and that. And you're worried about forgetting. Mm -hmm. So the advice is you write down a note. Okay, you, wait, you get out of bed, you write the note. Or if you don't write the note, you trust. Okay, let me forget it. That memory will appear again when I need it in the morning. That thought will appear to me again in the morning. So in terms of the, the need thoughts, the me thoughts is what we talk about here all the time. What does this mean? Right now, what is this mean? It's only consciousness, awareness. There is no me. This is perception, the sensation. There's no me. So, the me story is fiction. You have to keep revisiting that during the waking state. Until in the waking state, you are very, very, very clear, absolutely clear. There is no person. There is a body mind named Emmanuel. There is a car. It's a Toyota. There is a house. It's 15 Avenue, da Avenue, Avenue whatever. But there is no person. There is no personal entity. There is no personal consciousness. You have to visit that during the waking state until it's very clear for you. Yes, every time I look, I don't find a personality. I find thoughts, memories, sensing. Like the clouds passing, like the wind. And I find consciousness, awareness. Anything else? No. So that at some point in your night dreams, there will be less and less of I or even no I. Because the sleep state and the thoughts that arise during the sleep state are connected, then if there is an, a me in the waking state, there is going to be a me in the sleep state in some form or the other. And this me is about worrying and concerned and when am I going to get a better situation? Oh my God, am I going to succeed at this? How can you avoid insomnia? You cannot avoid insomnia. I think how many, 7 billion of us human beings really suffer from some form of insomnia. Some degree. Except, except my girlfriend. In some form she of puts, She puts her head on, yes. well, this is, on the pillow. This is, and So this is the art. And when you go to sleep, you rest your body, but also rest your mind. Let's your mind decide, okay, this is time for the mind. This is time. Tomorrow I'll pick up all the worries again, no problem. In a few hours, I'll pick up all the worries and more. But for now, tranquilo. Tomorrow, tomorrow will take care of tomorrow. Money, money will take care of itself tomorrow. Tomorrow. You're going to worry about it tomorrow. If you don't do that, then the habit is for you to try to 
figure it out even in your in your night dream, in your in your night mind. Then you cannot sleep. The body can the body wants to rest. But the body wants the mind to be quiet. <laughs> come with me. You know, the body wants the mind to come and rest with it, with it. Not just the body resting and the mind spinning. It doesn't work. So, thoughts arise. Is okay. That's not what I'm here for. I'm here to sleep. I am here to sleep. Meaning, restful body, resting body, resting mind. Okay, that's like about this thing of visualizations and this kind of stuff that I'm not also very familiar with that, but suddenly some kind of curiosity has started to to come uh, up about that but okay let's say that on one hand it can be like some kind of personal interest i have that. heard of, i have heard of people who See? have used visualization visualize money in your hands visualize uh, and later they told me wow it happened so what do i know i mean I, i've never used this but yes i have heard of some people who have said these sorts of things you see a lot of money see checks see cash coming through your hands see your bank account going bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and later the, not so much later these things happen to them yeah so, okay, but the, the 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 other maybe the other aspect of these kind of things that I feel also interested about, not only like the kind of personal things for my own personal benefit, but it's like when you have a I don't know a natural interest as a, as a human, for example, to develop some kind of activity, a career or or whatever you know something that that you like or you feel interested in. But also, for example, we usually, in our human experience, we don't develop maybe our full potential, the, the, the full potential of the mind, or sometimes even like the full potential of the body, for different reasons, because we are not interested in that, or maybe because we have been conditioned to think that it's not possible. It's just so maybe and I've been everything thinking is, like everything is possible. I think the, the conditioning that oh it's not possible, it, it, that's that is everything is is possible. It's infinite possibility. How do how do we know it's not possible? No, no, I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm yes. just like um saying this because it it's very common, you know, like we are conditioned to certain limits. And to think according to, the, to those limits. So I don't know. Maybe I feel well. Maybe it would be nice to to develop certain like a, a deeper sense of intuition, uh, more sense of well, you connectedness. Know, all, with, all you need with, to do is 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 uh, drop these conditions. It's conditioning. You, you, you don't need to develop a broader. Uh, nice, do I know? I don't know much about this stuff, but but if you have some conditioning uh, about limitation or anything like that, you can just drop this conditioning. Don't keep repeating. The, don't keep reinforcing these beliefs. You know that this is not possible. That's not possible. It happens to everybody. Doesn't happen to me. All these conditioning you can drop them. In the absence of this conditioning, we 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 become more and more open to infinite possibilities. Because we as consciousness, we are not conditioned. But then when we add the conditionings, we add limitations. All we need to do is don't buy into these conditionings. Be completely open to the mystery, to the unknown, to infinite possibilities. 
Just be open to infinite possibilities, infinite possibilities, whatever, in wealth, in health, in, you know, being able to levitate. Be open to that. Okay. If, the, if that interests you. Why? Why any limitation? Why any limitation? No. Any limitation. That, you yeah. Know, I, I, the I, the I, universe I, takes care of everything. Say, okay, look, universe, you have infinite possibilities and I'm not separate from you. Let's tango. Let's tango. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm here to tango. <laughs> Why? Because somehow the universe decided this. The universe decided this experience, you know? So I'm not going to go and hide in my hole and say, oh, is this possible? Or is that possible? No, I'm here to tangle, whatever. I don't know. What are we talking about? Okay. Traveling into astral space? Let's, let's do it. What? I don't know, whatever. Why any limitation? If the universe imposes limitation, that's fine. The universe may say, okay, you know what? For now, you can only jump, jump four feet off the ground. Okay, what can I do? <laughs> if that's what the universe is deciding, I can only jump four feet. I cannot jump ten feet. But I'm open. If the universe says, okay, now we can jump 20 feet. Okay, I'll jump 20 feet. I'll be, wow, I can jump 20 feet. You follow? So... There are no personal limitations. The universe decides. Yes, but for example, in this very simple uh, example of jumping, okay, maybe you say, okay, I can only jump four feet, but it doesn't it doesn't mean that maybe you can practice and develop certain set of uh, skills in the body for jump higher. Yeah, I don't know. Absolutely. For, because the thought, the thought that will come to me that says, wait a minute, maybe I can jump 20 feet. Let me, if I practice uh, some practices, I, I would be able to jump five feet, then eight feet, then 10 feet, then 20 feet. Mm -hmm. That thought that came to me comes from the universe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So That's the universe is saying, you know what? Hey, look, you know. Mm -hmm. Let's play the game of developing your jumping skills. Mm -hmm. Sports appear to me, and I, you know, I become interested. So, oh, yeah, I like that. I like that. Mm -hmm. Say, I like that. Or I may say, ah, no, I don't like that. That's crazy. I don't, I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested. It's okay. I may not be interested. It doesn't mean I cannot do it. Oh, I cannot do it. No, I'm, I'm, who cares? I actually, me personally, I don't care about jumping 10 feet or 20 feet. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing is that if you say, okay, well, when I when I am able to jump 20 feet, I will be happier. That's the that's a trap. Oh. It's not about that, but it's 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 about uh when you feel just some happiness is yeah. now. Happiness is now. Mm -hmm. Happiness is now. Happiness tomorrow is a story, you know, because if happiness is not now and it's going to be later, then it's yeah, yeah. then it can then la the later happiness can also be later and then later and then, <laughs> right? I mean, mm -hmm. happiness now sounds good to me. I like happiness now. Peace and happiness now, sure. I can give up some of my money, give up some of my food, give up some of my belonging, but I'm not, I'm not going to give up some of my happiness. Mm -hmm. That's no compromise, right? So happiness later, that's not very interesting. Because who knows? I mean, who knows what's going to happen between now and later? Many things can go wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. then I don't get that happiness. Mm -hmm. And also the happiness that I get, I can lose it. Because if I get it because I'm able to jump 20 feet, now I'm happy, I'm a champion, then I break my leg and I lose the happiness. I cannot jump five feet. So the, the happiness that I get, I can lose. But the happiness that is, 
I can neither get nor lose. Consciousness, awareness, I cannot get it, I cannot lose it. It is the reality of my experience. Mm -hmm. Consciousness is real, absolute. It's not phenomenal. It doesn't, it doesn't reside inside my bank account. It doesn't reside in the kitchen. It, it doesn't reside inside my head. Consciousness is real. Whatever is real is absolute. It's unopposed by another reality. It's not opposed by another reality. Reality two hits reality one. No, it's one reality. Which means no lack, fulfillment, freedom, peace. That's already on board. Consciousness already is. I mean, I am conscious. I is conscious. I it, consciousness is conscious that it's conscious. Consciousness is aware that it's aware. Consciousness is and knows it is. It's already on board. It's you don't have to work hard for it. It's there. It's what you are. So happiness, peace, and happiness is already there. It's what you are. Freedom, peace, and happiness is already what you are. Everything else, the separation, the limitation, is illusion. Mm -hmm. It's a belief in limitation, the belief in, se in separation, and the belief in limitation, and the belief in limit limited potential. Because the belief in limitation and the belief in limited potential go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. The belief in limitation and the belief in limited possibilities go hand in hand. Right? Yeah, sometimes this principle of, okay, happiness, peace, and fulfillment is already present. You know, it's my own nature. Sometimes it can be confusing in the sense that, okay, that's all. And in the human experience, there, there is nothing else to do. While, although, yes, happiness and peace is the full experience now, but in this human experience, we can we can keep playing, yeah, and you human, know, like ex yeah. exploring the the unlimitedness sure. of the, of the potential yes. of the game. Of... Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I mean, this life is there for for. I mean, there is sunshine, sun, sunrise, sunset. There are, there is the weather. There is a hunger. There is a, a food, shelter, and clothing. There are things happening in this life, and this. It's not, it's not like a, a blank state, you know, it's, it's a playground. But we don't need to play the game with a sense of lack and fear and worry and concern. No, yeah, it's there fine. available yeah. for exploration, for joy, for celebration, for sharing, for love, for the expression of love, for the celebration of beauty, mm -hmm. sharing the understanding. Uh, being friends, listening to others, whatever, you know, it, it, whatever is inspired by the understanding of one reality. Mm -hmm. Of course, life is a celebration. A celebration, a contemplation is a practical things in life to do things to try, things to explore. There are impersonal desires that are come to you. They come to you from where? From the universe. But you don't need the fear and the worry and the concern and the, oh my God, it's going to happen to me. What me? You don't need to channel the universe via the sense of limitation and separation. Okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Nice look, eh? Yes. <laughs> nice talking to you. Nice to be Thank with you, you all. Very, very lovely. Thank you all.